It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. As we begin the final six months of the presidency of Barack Obama, the nation is grappling with both the enormous question of who will succeed him and what the nation's agenda should be as of January 2017. There is a strong argument that in terms of the country's central direction in the years ahead, this will be one of the most pivotal elections in generations. One of the most urgent questions, almost certain to confront the new president during her or his first year in office, will be an issue that often dominated national debate in recent years, race in America. Police violence toward minority citizens, racial attitudes among white Americans, whether overt racism remains strong in the country, whether structural racism embedded in our schools, companies, and other institutions is silently injuring millions of Americans largely unseen. As tension flared around these questions after the police shootings in Ferguson, Missouri, Baltimore, and other cities, many Americans were bewildered that even after the landmark election of our first African-American president and so many other signs of progress in the past five decades, the country remained a tinderbox. And neither our president or any other leader seemed able to effectively address what was happening. To wrestle with these immense questions as part of our ongoing examination of the biggest challenges facing our next national leader, the Miller Center asked a group of scholars representing a wide political and academic spectrum to offer their recommendations to the next president for establishing a new and more effective approach to race. In this episode, we'll discuss the ideas offered by two of them, both among our nation's most brilliant and impassioned intellectuals. Michael Eric Dyson, a sociologist at Georgetown University and the author of many, many books, has been an outspoken critic and a Times supporter of President Obama's performance in office. Earlier this year, he published a new volume titled The Black Presidency, Barack Obama and the Politics of Race in America. Also with us is Elizabeth Hinton, a professor of history and African and African-American studies at Harvard. Her research examines how government programs initially aimed at ending poverty, improving housing, and providing other social aid to struggling Americans evolved after the height of the civil rights movement into the aggressive policing at the center of so much current upheaval. She also has a new book, hot off the presses this summer, titled From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime the making of mass incarceration in America. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you, Thank you for having us. us. Uh, in the, the two essays that, that you have written, uh, you both lay out uh, uh, an analysis of the situation in the country now, some of the history that led us to this place, and then make some recommendations. Uh, but, but Michael, you, in, in your essay, you also drew from a speech given by Hillary Clinton uh, in Charleston shortly after the terrible massacre in Emanuel Church there. But you praised her candor uh, in your essay and said that one of the things the next president has to do uh, is to adopt that kind of candor, I think maybe even more so, but to, to explicitly acknowledge the scale and depth of the issues that remain and to and to and hold back in no way uh, as to the severity of the specific problems that African Americans face. But what's the value of that? What, what do you mean by that? Well, first of all, I think that's absolutely right. I think that in pointing to what uh, Secretary Clinton was doing was to talk about a concrete example of a political figure in office who has held high office and been uh, held high appointment, um, who speaks rather directly and explicitly about race. The explicit had to be underscored there because it was in contradistinction to uh, what I talked about as the, st the strategic inadvertence of Barack Obama. Let's not approach it directly, let's approach it indirectly. Let's do it by inference, let's do it some ways by implication, but let's not tackle that beast head on. Uh, let's look at the hind part, so to speak. And then I talked about the noble implicit, um, whereas you know a white privilege is never spoken about in terms that are put on the table that people have to confront, but Im implicated and implicitly talked about. And then the heroic explicit was when you beat up on black people and very, uh, and are seen to be very heroic for saying black people need to have their uh, houses in order, the pathologies need to be addressed in their families and the like. So when you look at those three strategic approaches by Obama, 
I felt that what Hillary Clinton was doing was put the facts on the table, put those facts within a narrative that was compelling, help the masses of white Americans and others comprehend why it's so important, and then articulate an overarching political and public policy vision that could address that. I felt that Barack Obama, under enormous duress and extraordinary pressure, uh, was forced by those circumstances, as well as his own choosing, a kind of hesitancy and racial procrastination that had lethal consequences. When you put all that stuff together, the next president has to be explicit, articulate those values that are important, public policies that can address them, and help America grapple with the persistent racism that we see manifest. Elizabeth, you don't, you don't say, you don't say it in precisely those same words, but you invoke uh, the, uh, a similar sentiment of the, the need for an explicit addressing of the issues that are faced by African Americans. How important is this, this notion of, of separating, that's what I think is Michael is suggesting, is separating the idea that, that the government needs to do things that help all people, and along with that will come minorities and, and anyone else who, who, who faces difficulty uh, in this idea that, no, we've got to stop doing it that way, stop saying it that way. That seemed peaceable in the past, but we have to be willing to say explicitly that this is a specific terrible thing faced by this one group of people, and it needs to be acknowledged as a different thing and addressed. And I think you do say that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, building off of some of the comments that Hillary Clinton's made, I think it's promising that she's able to use the, these these staggering figures about racial inequality and say, the Schomburg Center, now when the CBC endorsed her, that she wants to make ending inequality. She doesn't say racial inequality. She says making ending inequality the mission of her presidency, which is promising. However, American inequality is not going to end until we really confront head on racism and the historical legacies of enslavement. And I think that is, is part of what Professor Dyson's talking about, that we need to explicitly, because Slavery was racially targeted. We're still dealing with the impact of slavery today. It has seeped into not only our policies, not only the ways in which we allocate resources, but the worldview of many Americans. We have to deal with, with those legacies and the, the ways in which African Americans since emancipation have been structurally prevented from really being able to come up with their own solutions to the problems facing their communities. And that's part of what my recommendation was about, that we return to some of the more transformative aspects of the war on poverty, the notion of maximum feasible participation, where the federal government was empowering community groups to solve their own problems on their own terms. But when you say that, the, that there should be uh, the availability of resources for these communities to then decide for themselves how to resolve the, some, of, some of their issues or address some of the issues that they must confront. W what do you mean by that? I mean, how specific can you be about that? Well, I think that we have, that the, the response to some of the kind of most pressing problems faced in our society, what some people might call urban crisis, failing public schools, mass employment, et cetera, for the past half century has really been privileging punitive responses instead of really thinking about fundamental, more structural changes. And I think, you know, the war on poverty essentially provided low-income Americans, urban and rural, an opportunity for job training measures, an opportunity to receive remedial education, for skills building, homemaking, workshops, things like that. Instead, we need a job, we, we need job creation programs. We need a different and more kind of transformative, larger, broader response to these problems that go beyond um, punitive, punitive force, incarceration, surveillance, et cetera. Obama has taken the worst of the Johnson administration and left the best behind. The worst was the transition from war on poverty to war on crime because there were forces that abated, mitigated against the vicious intensity and, if you will, focus on black communities through processes of crime. Inadvertently, if you give a person a job or an occupation, if they have CETA or Neighborhood Youth Corps where they have jobs and outlets, then that energy is redirected toward uplifting uh, engagement. For some in Chicago and Detroit, midnight basketball, particular right. programs began to be articulated. But her point is, and I think so powerfully, is that even those communities don't know what to ask. They ask for what is uh, ahead of them. I'm not saying more broadly, some don't know, but in general, don't know what to ask and therefore demand what is most necessary, what most would remedy the situation more immediately, and the broader structural issues that are preventing the flourishing of these communities are masked, and then they are rearticulated as, oh, you've got a crime in your community, right. you've got to clean that up.
The problem is when you view behavior and pathology as the root cause of poverty, then your policy programs are limited in terms of how to actually address that poverty. Right. And, and one, of the, one of the observations that, that, Michael, that you make in the essay is that you say that, like William Junius Wilson, that, that you also shared that view at one time, that, the, uh, mm. you, that you share the same view as the president of, of President Obama of that, uh, that, mm. that non-specific. No, 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 I've always been a, a, a fan of targeted, in fact, mm -hmm. approaches. I said to the president in the White House when we had a friendly uh, but vigorous engagement. I said, I don't, I don't believe in one size fits all. So from the very beginning, I've been a targeted kind of guy as opposed to, uh, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. The, and you specifically say in one of your recommendations, um, uh, which I, I take it mistakenly thought was a change in your views, but, um, <laughs> right. that was but, Wilson, that but you have the recommendation that, you know, uh, specifically for group specific remedies, which you right, were just right. describing, mm -hmm. to, and to, to not shy away from that. Right. Uh, at the same time, though, I mean, have, don't we have all, haven't we established, whether for good or bad, uh, that, that, that's, that the Supreme Court and others viewed that approach to these sorts of things as an unconstitutional, an, an, an undoable thing, that, that ultimately we can't, now that we have a constitution that says you can't discriminate, and by that meaning you can't be selective about, by, in term, on the basis of race, for what the government does for anybody, is it possible to do that? I mean, can you identify that here's an issue that Hispanics, or here's an issue that is uniquely uh, terrible for African Americans. Can the government acknowledge they, they, that it's openly doing that? Look, they ain't gave up on it when it comes to targeting black or brown people negatively. Right. They're, they're, the, right. the specificity <laughs> of the target is remarkable, right. and the breathtaking character of Professor Hinton's book suggests that. Uh, what they're arguing against is the ability to relieve the burden in a positive fashion. Right. Now, because of a, a, a narrow, see, seeing affirmative action as reverse discrimination tells you that terminologically mm -hmm. and, met, and, and, and even metaphorically, uh, they've already got the relationship wrong. They think that if we address an issue of sustained injustice, that to relieve the burden of that is somehow to t flip the table and to do to white people what white people had already done to black people and brown and other people. You talk about as well that the next president has a real imperative to lead a transition from mass incarceration onto another thing. Now, you're not hugely specific about, about what that transition would look like or where it would go, but, but um, are you talking about a continuation of where the Obama administration finally ended up, it's very unfinished, or do you mean something substantially more than that. I think we need to go well beyond the, the at least in terms of, of criminal justice reforms that have been introduced in, in his administration, we need to go well beyond if we really want to cease being the, the world's largest incarcerator because right now everything is focused on, in, in terms of criminal justice reform, on ending the war on drugs. Even the, um, the, the, the uh, incarcerated people in federal prisons who Obama recently converted their sentences were all in there for drug offenses. And if we let out all of the people who are in our prison system for non-violent drug offenses, we'd still be this humongous mass incarceration society. So we need to go beyond that. We need to go beyond, again, thinking about um, the reentry programs for formerly incarcerated people. They look very much like what we saw in the War on Poverty. Their, their job training programs, their skill building programs. We need to give people routes to actual jobs, we need job creation programs, we need access to education within prisons, we need to end the restriction on um, people who are incarcerated receiving scholarships to go to college. We need to undo the criminalization of social welfare programs, all of these things. You know, it's not as if these, these social problems aren't connected in some ways. And so I think, you know, the, it's, it's good that we're beginning to rethink uh, our criminal justice system, but we've got to rethink all of its parts in order to have really cohesive change. What, what is promising is that I think that racism is being talked about in ways that it hasn't been uh, really um, for at least in, in my lifetime. I have not seen these kinds of discussions about racism happening at, 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 at the highest levels of government and among and in, in the popular media. And so I think, you know, but it, again, it's up, to, it's up to the people to keep on pushing those discussions forward or else I fear that they will you know, go, go dormant. If you were imagining whoever this next president is, and let's just pretend for a minute that whoever wins could conceivably say whatever you would want them to say, uh, but, but what would that be? I mean, beyond we need to end mass incarceration, mm -hmm. if, if you really wanted them to say, okay, we've got to start with this, this, and this, or maybe even just mm -hmm. this, you, what, what might that message be? I would want the next president to say, I will no longer respond to social ills, to problems of 
unemployment, mass unemployment, poverty, failing school systems. I will no longer respond to these problems with policing, with surveillance, with various forms of confinement, with incarceration. We need to, to really have a value shift and really commit, and it's a long-term commitment. I think if President Obama were here right now, um, uh, he'd do a better job of saying this than me, but I, um, uh, but I think one of the responses that he would have to this, uh, if he were being really honest, would be, look, the President of the United States has Limit, as powerful as I am, uh, has limited reach over these things. Is there a case to be made that actually presidents have a greater degree of power over these kinds of complicated issues than even they believe, than, a, than Barack Obama believed? Well, well, look, I mean, one of the arguments has been through the history of presidential scholarship is that the greatest power a president may ultimately have is a rhetorical one. Mm -hmm. That is, to set the tone, to say the, to the nation, th this is the problem. When we think of Ronald Reagan, slipping the surly bonds, right? In terms of the aftermath of that disaster with Challenger, I believe it was. Or think about John F. Kennedy, uh, ask not, you know, or, you know, channeling Khalil Gibran. Or think about, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. The point is, time and again, presidents are known for setting a tone. And Obama has not even seized upon the rhetorical capital available to him to articulate these visions in a different way. Notice what she said that if he could say, we're not going to respond in a knee-jerk fashion, in a reactionary measure against the problems we see spread out, metastasizing across the body politic, with po over-policing. That means police people are not gonna be at your schoolhouse as they are not in the schoolhouses of right. up, upper crust, white, and, and in some cases, people of color's schools. So that's number one. Why is that important? Because if a police person is there, then when there's a problem, it gets policed. The president's rhetorical responsibility and capability of intervening upon that measure by saying, no, this is not the way we should go. This is not the response we should have. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody holding back Obama from executive orders and right. from making speeches right. and from intervening the way he has, for instance, with gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual mm -hmm. people to a certain degree and certainly to a certain degree with the immigration issue. Look at Obama mm -hmm. in England, across the pond celebrating and praising gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, queer people for acting up and forcing his mm -hmm. hand to make a policy change, uh, uh, also with his children, his enlightened daughters, as many Americans are informed by their children, said to him, we have gay and lesbian people who are parents, stop it. So the combination mm -hmm. of his uh, existential network of relations as well as his understanding of what happened in terms of the history of response by this community f caused him, he said, to change his mind. At the same time that he reprimands Black Lives Matter. At the same time he says, hey, it's all right to do what you do, but yelling at people ultimately is not gonna, so power will dictate the terms by which power is challenged. Mm -hmm. Do you see it quite as severely as that? You know, you know, are you as frustrated with uh, President Obama's approach to those questions as, as Michael obviously is? I'll, uh, Certainly, and I, I think that Michael makes a really important point in his book, which is that you know Obama has been limited in, in even being able to address these issues. I think that I think that a lot of African Americans who invested um, hope and change in his presidency, addressing these issues that have always been at the forefront of our minds, but that I think are more and more becoming part of national discussions, as I've said, have been underwhelmed by. Um, by a lack of, of, of specific attention on the problem of racism as it affects African Americans during, in, in Obama's resident, uh, his, his, his rhetoric and during his presidency. We've got two almost certain nominees, um, uh, uh, certain nominees now for, for president. Uh, one of them, you know, one of, uh, Michael cites one of them in, you know, in his essay mm -hmm. in a somewhat positive way, and, but, but certainly Hillary Clinton uh, on the, conceptually would, would certainly acknowledge that racism is an important issue mm -hmm. and would at least be in the beginnings of the zone that you guys would, would probably say that she should be. Mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump would, I'm certain, say that racism is a bad thing and racism should disappear by the, by the end of his time as president mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. uh, but perhaps is not going to say some of the other things that, that you might hope for. But what do you do if you're trying to, as an intellectual leader, uh, what do you do if Donald Trump becomes president of the United States? 
She's already got her passport well, to know. <laughs> I don't because I, I am proud to be American and I'm not, you know, I, I, I want to be able to help change the country for the better. I feel like if, you know, people who say that, I'm dedicated to making this country be as, as good as it can be and, and leaving the country and not continuing to fight to make it better. Mm. Um, it's part of the work that I do. It's part of why I researched the problems that, that, I, that I have in the book. I think, you know, there are some people that say, well, if, if, if Donald Trump's president, then, you know, things will get so bad that maybe they'll, they'll, they'll get better. I think we need to keep the dialogues going. I think that, um, that regardless, <laughs> these issues, racism is kind of reaching a new uh, threshold in, in our society and people are talking about it in different ways and I would hope that that those conversations as well as the protest movements that that we see will continue to put pressure on the Trump administration to make America what it should be and which, which is not necessarily you know the, the kind of vision that, um, that that he seems to be projecting I think that you know he, there's a, there, there seems to be a lot of divisions and we need to really really work to show commonalities that targeting policies for African Americans is not at the expense of low-income white Americans or, or affluent white Americans. Michael, if, if President Trump said to you, uh, you know, yes, I agree with you, racism is a bad thing and he's come to an end, I don't have a racist bone in my body, uh, and I agree with you that, that we've got to do a better job of preventing these bad things from happening in the future, mm -hmm. but I'm sorry, we do also have to speak candidly about the thugs that you're not asking for affirmative action for. Mm -hmm. And there are people who have to clean up their own conduct and straighten, straighten themselves up. And there is some dimension of that that has to be a testosterone dimension of, of the formula. What do you say to Donald Trump if, if he or a conservative thinker makes a more eloquent version of that case? What do you say to that person? <laughs> Well, look, that, that, that case has been made time and again, perhaps from time immemorial in terms of the origins of ideology. Uh, that's nothing new to say that people have to comport themselves in a certain fashion. You mentioned earlier Bill Cosby. He was addicted to that. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote a column for Ebony Magazine where he gave practical advice to Negroes, as we were then called, about how to handle their particular issues. Booker T. Washington, W.B. Du Bois, Nanny, Helen's Bur Nanny Helen Burroughs. So the fact is you have to be ignorant of the broad swath of, um, of the broad reach and trajectory of African American thought mm -hmm. about these issues to, to make it as if it's something new, number one. To pretend that every pronouncement that Clarence Thomas makes every 10 years uh, is something that is novel, uh, that is insightful, or some new black conservative. So I say to, to Donald Trump, look, black people are just as invested in wanting our communities not to be run over with thugs. Mm -hmm. Stop giving them badges and guns. Stop, uh, you know, giving them the ability to roll up in black communities under a no snitch policy that the police department abides by because it refuses to tell the truth about the thin blue line that ostensibly should protect us from the marauding criminals, except those criminals turn out to be often those with badges and guns. So I would say, A, you got to deal with that. B, uh, there are many in the African-American community, among with, uh, along with Latinos who are culturally conservative, who have moral mm -hmm. principles rooted in the Ten Commandments, who want nothing more than to clean up these communities. Again, don't demonize and pre-criminalize African-American, Latino, and even poor white people. And then thirdly, uh, what we've got to do is to say, uh, from the very day that uh, Donald Trump takes office, we want to make America great again. Let's take it right, back from the right. Donald Trumps of the world mm -hmm. and give it back to those who worked hard to make certain that this country would be what it is. Uh, it was uh, Howard Thurman, the great prophetic mystic, who said, never reduce your dreams to the level of the event, which is your immediate experience. This particular thing will not last always. He said, our slave foreparents saw a future we couldn't even imagine. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the leisure to become so cynical that it prevents us and precludes us from grasping hold of a future that was manifest in Martin Luther King Jr.'s vernacular articulation. I ain't going nowhere. This is my country. I love it. I helped build it. My blood has nourished the soil of American democracy from which has sprung so many great institutions. So we are right. committed to do something more important and more valuable than leave. We want to stay mm -hmm. and reform American culture according to those mm -hmm. lights. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Hinton, Michael Eric Dyson, thank you for being here. Thank you for what you do. Not everybody would agree with everything that any of us have said here, but I think you make us think about this in the, these important things in, in important and different ways. Thank you. Thank you.
And thank you to our viewers for your emails and online comments and for keeping this discussion going with the people around you. Constructive, original, fresh, informed dialogue is what this program is about. We also hope you'll tell us what you think at the Miller Center Facebook page or by following us on Twitter at Douglas Blackman or at American Forum TV or at Michael Eric Dyson or at El Eliza B. Hinton. To send us a comment, watch other episodes, download podcasts or read a transcript Visit us at MillerCenter.org, American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you.